The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter seventy three, part one. The Promise. It was indeed Maximilian Morel who had passed a wretched existence since the previous day. With the instinct peculiar to lovers, he had anticipated after the return of Madame de Saint Marin and the death of the Marquis that something would occur at Monsieur de Villefort's in connection with his attachment for Valentine. His presentiments were realized, as we shall see, and his uneasy forebodings had goaded him pale and trembling to the gate under the chestnut trees. Valentine was ignorant of the cause of this sorrow and anxiety and as it was not his accustomed hour for visiting her, she had gone to the spot simply by accident, or perhaps through sympathy. Morel called her, and she ran to the gate. "'You are here at this hour?' said she. "'Yes, my poor girl,' replied Morel. "'I come to bring and to hear bad tidings.' "'This is indeed a house of mourning,' said Valentine. "'Speak, Maximilian, although the cup of sorrow seems already full.' "'Dear Valentine,' said Morel, endeavouring to conceal his own emotion, "'listen, I entreat you. "'What I am about to say is very serious. "'When are you to be married?' "'I will tell you all,' said Valentine. "'From you I have nothing to conceal. "'This morning the subject was introduced, "'and my dear grandmother, on whom I depended as my only support, "'not only declared herself favourable to it, "'but is so anxious for it that they only await the arrival of Monsieur de Ipinay and the following day the contract will be signed. A deep sigh escaped the young man, who gazed long and mournfully at her he loved. Alas, replied he, it is dreadful thus to hear my condemnation from your own lips. The sentence is passed, and in a few hours will be executed. It must be so, and I will not endeavour to prevent it. But since you say nothing remains but for Monsieur de Epinay to arrive that the contract may be signed, and the following day you will be his. To-morrow you will be engaged to Monsieur de Epinay, for he came this morning to Paris. Valentine uttered a cry. I was at the house of Monte Cristo an hour since, said Morel. We were speaking, he of the sorrow your family had experienced, and I of your grief when a carriage rolled into the courtyard. Never till then had I placed any confidence in presentiments, but now I cannot help believing them, Valentine. At the sound of that carriage I shuddered, Soon I heard steps on the staircase, which terrified me as much as the footsteps of the commander did Don Juan. The door at last opened. Albert de Morcerf entered, and I began to hope my fears were vain, when after him another young man advanced, and the Count exclaimed, Ah, here is the Baron Franz de Epinay. I summoned all my strength and courage to my support. Perhaps I turned pale and trembled but certainly I smiled, and five minutes after I left, without having heard one word that had passed. Poor Maximilian, murmured Valentine. Valentine, the time has arrived that you must answer me. And remember, my life depends on your answer. What do you intend doing? Valentine held down her head. She was overwhelmed. Listen, said Morel, it is not the first time you have contemplated our present position, which is a serious and urgent one. I do not think it is a moment to give way to useless sorrow. Leave that for those who like to suffer at their leisure and indulge their grief in secret. There are such in the world, and God will doubtless reward them in heaven for their resignation on earth. But those who mean to contend must not lose one precious moment, but must return immediately the blow which fortune strikes. Do you intend to struggle against our ill fortune? Tell me, Valentine, for it is that I came to know." Valentine trembled and looked at him with amazement. The idea of resisting her father, her grandmother, and all the family had never occurred to her. "'What do you say, Maximilian?' asked Valentine. "'What do you mean by a struggle? Oh, it would be sacrilege. What? I resist my father's order and my dying grandmother's wish? Impossible!' Morel started. You are too noble not to understand me, and yet you understand me so well that you already yield, dear Maximilian. No, no, I shall need all my strength to struggle with myself and support my grief in secret, as you say, but to grieve my father, to disturb my grandmother's last moments, never. You are right, said Morel calmly. In what a tone you speak, cried Valentine. I speak as one who admires you, mademoiselle. 
Mademoiselle, cried Valentine, Mademoiselle, oh, selfish man, he sees me in despair and pretends he cannot understand me. You mistake. I understand you perfectly. You will not oppose Monsieur Villefort. You will not displease the Marchioness, and to-morrow you will sign the contract which will bind you to your husband. But, mon Dieu, tell me, how can I do otherwise? Do not appeal to me, mademoiselle. I shall be a bad judge in such a case. My selfishness will blind me, replied Morel, whose low voice and clenched hands announced his growing desperation. What would you have proposed, Maximilian, had you found me willing to accede? It is not for me to say. You are wrong. You must advise me what to do. Do you seriously ask my advice, Valentine? Certainly, dear Maximilian, for if it is good, I will follow it. You know my devotion to you. Valentine, said Morel, pushing aside a loose plank, give me your hand in token of forgiveness of my anger. My senses are confused, and during the last hour the most extravagant thoughts have passed through my brain. Oh, if you refuse my advice! What do you advise? said Valentine, raising her eyes to heaven and sighing. I am free, replied Maximilian, and rich enough to support you. I swear to make you my lawful wife before my lips even shall have approached your forehead. You make me tremble, said the young girl. Follow me, said Morel. I will take you to my sister, who is worthy also to be yours. We will embark for Algiers, for England, for America, or, if you prefer it, retire to the country, and only return to Paris when our friends have reconciled your family. Valentine shook her head. I feared it, Maximilian, she said. It is the counsel of a madman, and I should be more mad than you did I not stop you at once with the word, impossible, impossible. You will then submit to what fate decrees for you without even attempting to contend with it, said Morel sorrowfully. Yes, if I die. Well, Valentine, resumed Maximilian, I can only say again that you are right. Truly it is I who am mad, and you prove to me that passion blinds the most well-meaning. I appreciate your calm reasoning. It is then understood that to-morrow you will be irrevocably promised to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, not only by that theatrical formality invented to heighten the effect of a comedy called the signature of the contract, but your own will. Again you drive me to despair, Maximilian, said Valentine. Again you plunge the dagger into the wound. What would you do, tell me, if your sister listened to such a proposition? Mademoiselle, replied Morel, with a bitter smile, I am selfish. You have already said so, and as a selfish man I think not of what others would do in my situation, but of what I intend doing myself. I think only that I have known you not a whole year. From the first day I saw you, all my hopes of happiness have been in securing your affection. One day you acknowledged that you loved me, and since that day my hope of future happiness has rested on obtaining you, for to gain you would be life to me. Now I think no more. I say only that fortune has turned against me. I had thought to gain heaven, and now I have lost it. It is an everyday occurrence for a gambler to lose not only what he possesses, but also what he has not. Morel pronounced these words with perfect calmness. Valentine looked at him a moment with her large, scrutinizing eyes, endeavoring not to let Morel discover the grief which struggled in her heart. "'But in a word, what are you going to do?' asked she. "'I am going to have the honor of taking my leave of you, mademoiselle, solemnly assuring you that I wish your life may be so calm, so happy, and so fully occupied that there may be no place for me even in your memory.' "'Oh,' murmured Valentine. "'Adieu, Valentine, adieu,' said Morel, bowing. "'Where are you going?' cried the young girl, extending her hand through the opening, and seizing Maximilian by his coat, for she understood from her own agitated feelings that her lover's calmness could not be real. "'Where are you going?' "'I am going that I may not bring fresh trouble into your family, and to set an example which every honest and devoted man situated as I am may follow. "'Before you leave me, tell me what you are going to do, Maximilian.' The young man smiled sorrowfully. "'Speak, speak,' said Valentine. "'I entreat you. "'Has your resolution changed, Valentine?' "'It cannot change, unhappy man. "'You know it must not,' cried the young girl. "'Then adieu, Valentine.' Valentine shook the gate with a strength of which she could not have been supposed to be possessed as Morel was going away, and passing both her hands through the opening, she clasped and wrung them. "'I must know what you mean to do,' said she. "'Where are you going?' 
"'Oh, fear not,' said Maximilian, stopping at a short distance. "'I do not intend to render another man responsible for the rigorous fate reserved for me. "'Another might threaten to seek M. Franz, to provoke him and to fight with him. "'All that would be folly. What has M. Franz to do with it? "'He saw me this morning for the first time, and has already forgotten he has seen me. "'He did not even know I existed when it was arranged by your two families that you should be united.' I have no enmity against M. Franz, and promise you the punishment shall not fall on him. On whom, then? On me? On you? Valentine! Oh, heaven forbid! Woman is sacred. The woman one loves is holy. On yourself, then, unhappy man? On yourself? I am the only guilty person, am I not? said Maximilian. Maximilian, said Valentine. Maximilian, come back, I entreat you. He drew near with his sweet smile, and but for his paleness one might have thought him in his usual happy mood. "'Listen, my dear, my adored Valentine,' said he in his melodious and grave voice. "'Those who, like us, have never had a thought for which we need blush before the world, such may read each other's hearts. I never was romantic, and am no melancholy hero. I imitate neither Manfred nor Anthony, but without words, protestations, or vows my life has entwined itself with yours.' You leave me, and you are right in doing so. I repeat it, you are right. But in losing you, I lose my life. The moment you leave me, Valentine, I am alone in the world. My sister is happily married. Her husband is only my brother-in-law. That is, a man whom the ties of social life alone attach to me. No one then longer needs my useless life. This is what I shall do. I will wait until the very moment you are married. FOR I WILL NOT LOSE THE SHADOW OF ONE OF THOSE UNEXPECTED CHANCES WHICH ARE SOMETIMES RESERVED FOR US, SINCE M. FRANZ MAY, AFTER ALL, DIE BEFORE THAT TIME. A THUNDERBOLT MAY FALL EVEN ON THE ALTAR AS YOU APPROACH IT. NOTHING APPEARS IMPOSSIBLE TO ONE CONDEMNED TO DIE, AND MIRACLES APPEAR QUITE REASONABLE WHEN HIS ESCAPE FROM DEATH IS CONCERNED. I WILL, THEN, WAIT UNTIL THE LAST MOMENT, AND WHEN MY MISERY IS CERTAIN, IRREDEEMABLE, HOPELESS, I WILL WRITE A CONFIDENTIAL LETTER TO MY BROTHER-IN-LAW, another to the prefect of police to acquaint them with my intention, and at the corner of some wood, on the brink of some abyss, on the bank of some river, I will put an end to my existence, as certainly as I am the son of the most honest man who ever lived in France. Valentine trembled convulsively. She loosened her hold of the gate. Her arms fell by her side, and two large tears rolled down her cheeks. The young man stood before her, sorrowful and resolute. Oh, for pity's sake, said she, you will live, will you not? No, on my honor, said Maximilian, but that will not affect you. You have done your duty, and your conscience will be at rest. Valentine fell on her knees and pressed her almost bursting heart. Maximilian, said she, Maximilian, my friend, my brother on earth, my true husband in heaven, I entreat you, do as I do live in suffering. Perhaps we may one day be united." Adieu, Valentine, repeated Morel. My God, said Valentine, raising both her hands to heaven with a sublime expression, I have done my utmost to remain a submissive daughter. I have begged, entreated, implored. He has regarded neither my prayers, my entreaties, nor my tears. It is done, cried she, willing away her tears and resuming her firmness. I am resolved not to die of remorse, but rather of shame. Live, Maximilian, and I will be yours. Say when it shall be, speak, command, I will obey. Morel, who had already gone some few steps away, again returned, and pale with joy, extended both hands towards Valentine through the opening. Valentine, he said, dear Valentine, you must not speak thus, rather let me die. Why should I obtain you by violence, if our love is mutual? Is it from mere humanity you bid me live? I would then rather die. Truly, murmured Valentine, who on this earth cares for me if he does not? Who has consoled me in my sorrow but he? On whom do my hopes rest? On whom does my bleeding heart repose? On him. On him, always on him. Yes, you are right, Maximilian. I will follow you. I will leave the paternal home. I will give up all. Oh, ungrateful girl that I am, cried Valentine, sobbing. I will give up all, even my dear old grandfather, whom I had nearly forgotten. No, said Maximilian, you shall not leave him. Monsieur Nortier has evinced, you say, a kind feeling toward me. Well, before you leave, tell him all. His consent would be your justification in God's sight. 
As soon as we are married, he shall come and live with us. Instead of one child, he shall have two. You have told me how you talk to him and how he answers you. I shall very soon learn that language by signs, Valentine, and promise you solemnly that instead of despair it is happiness that awaits us. Oh, see, Maximilian, see the power you have over me. You almost make me believe you, and yet what you tell me is madness, for my father will curse me. He is inflexible. He will never pardon me. Now listen to me, Maximilian. If by artifice, by entreaty, by accident, in short, if by any means I can delay this marriage, will you wait? Yes, I promise you, as faithfully as you have promised me that this horrible marriage shall not take place, and that if you are dragged before a magistrate or a priest, you will refuse. I promise you by all that is most sacred to me in the world, namely by my mother. We will wait, then, said Morel. Yes, we will wait, replied Valentine, who revived at these words. There are so many things which may save unhappy beings such as we. I rely on you, Valentine, said Morel. All you do will be well done, only if they disregard your prayers, if your father and Madame de St. Marin insist that Monsieur de Epinay should be called to-morrow to sign the contract. Then you have my promise, Maximilian. Instead of signing, I will go to you and we will fly. But from this moment until then, let us not tempt Providence. Let us not see each other. It is a miracle. It is a Providence that we have not been discovered. If we were surprised, if it were known that we met thus, we should have no further resource. You are right, Valentine, but how shall I ascertain? From the notary, Monsieur de Champs. I know him, and for myself I will write to you depend on me. I dread this marriage, Maximilian, as much as you. Thank you, my adored Valentine, thank you, that is enough. When once I know the hour, I will hasten to this spot. You can easily get over this fence with my assistance. A carriage will await us at the gate, in which you will accompany me to my sisters. There living, retired, or mingling in society, as you wish, we shall be enabled to use our power to resist oppression, and not suffer ourselves to be put to death like sheep, which only defend themselves by sighs. Yes, said Valentine, I will now acknowledge you are a right, Maximilian, and now are you satisfied with your betrothal, said the young girl sorrowfully. My adored Valentine, words cannot express one half of my satisfaction. Valentine had approached, or rather had placed her lips so near the fence that they nearly touched those of Morel, which were pressed against the other side of the cold and inexorable barrier. Adieu, then, till we meet again, said Valentine, tearing herself away. I shall hear from you. Yes. Thanks, thanks, dear love, adieu. The sound of a kiss was heard, and Valentine fled through the avenue. Morel listened to catch the last sound of her dress brushing the branches and of her footsteps on the gravel, then raised his eyes with an ineffable smile of thankfulness to heaven for being permitted to be thus loved, and then also disappeared. The young man returned home, and waited all the evening and all the next day without getting any message. It was only on the following day, at about ten o'clock in the morning, as he was starting to call on Monsieur de Champs, the notary, that he received from the postman a small billet, which he knew to be from Valentine, although he had not before seen her writing. It was to this effect. Tears, entreaties, prayers have availed me nothing. Yesterday, for two hours, I was at the church of St. Philip de Rule, and for two hours I prayed most fervently. Heaven is as inflexible as man, and the signature of the contract is fixed for this evening at nine o'clock. I have but one promise, and but one heart to give. That promise is pledged to you, that heart is also yours. This evening, then, at a quarter to nine at the gate, your betrothed, Valentine de Villefort. P.S. My poor grandmother gets worse and worse. Yesterday her fever amounted to delirium. Today her delirium is almost madness. You will be very kind to me, will you not, Morel, to make me forget my sorrow in leaving her thus? I think it is kept a secret from Grandpapa Nortier that this contract is to be signed this evening. Morel went also to the notary, who confirmed the news that the contract was to be signed that evening. Then he went to call on Monte Cristo and heard still more. Franz had been to announce the ceremony, and Madame de Villefort had also written to beg the Count to excuse her not inviting him. The death of Monsieur de St. Marin and the dangerous illness of his widow would cast a gloom over the meeting which she would regret should be shared by the Count whom she wished every happiness. The day before, Franz had been presented to Madame de St. Marin, who had left her bed to receive him, but had been obliged to return to it immediately after. It is easy to suppose that Morel's agitation would not escape the Count's penetrating eye. 
Monte Cristo was more affectionate than ever. Indeed, his manner was so kind that several times Morel was on the point of telling him all, but he recalled the promise he had made to Valentine, and kept his secret. The young man read Valentine's letter twenty times in the course of the day. It was her first, and on what an occasion! Each time he read it he renewed his vow to make her happy. How great is the power of a woman who has made so courageous a resolution! What devotion does she deserve from him for whom she has sacrificed everything? How ought she really to be supremely loved? She becomes at once a queen and a wife, and it is impossible to thank and love her sufficiently. Morel longed intensely for the moment when he should hear Valentine say, Here I am, Maximilian. Come and help me. He had arranged everything for her escape. Two ladders were hidden in the clover field. A cabriolet was ordered for Maximilian alone, without a servant, without lights. At the turning of the first street they would light the lamps, as it would be foolish to attract the notice of the police by too many precautions. Occasionally he shuddered. He thought of the moment when, from the top of that wall, he should protect the descent of his dear Valentine, pressing in his arms for the first time, her of whom he had yet only kissed the delicate hand. When the afternoon arrived, and he felt that the hour was drawing near, he wished for solitude. His agitation was extreme. A simple question from a friend would have irritated him. He shut himself in his room and tried to read, but his eye glanced over the page without understanding a word, and he threw away the book, and for the second time sat down to sketch his plan, the ladders and the fence. At length the hour drew near. Never did a man deeply in love allow the clocks to go on peacefully. Morel tormented his so effectually that they struck eight at half-past six. Then he said, It is time to start. The signature was indeed fixed to take place at nine o'clock, but perhaps Valentine will not wait for that. Consequently, Morel, having left the Rue Millet at half-past eight by his timepiece, entered the clover field while the clock of St. Philippe du Roule was striking eight. The horse and cabriolet were concealed behind a small room where Morel had often waited. The night gradually drew on, and the foliage in the garden assumed a deeper hue. Then Morel came out from his hiding-place with a beating heart and looked through the small opening in the gate. There was yet no one to be seen. The clock struck half-past eight, and still another half-hour was passed in waiting, while Morel walked to and fro and gazed more and more frequently through the opening. The garden became darker still, but in the darkness he looked in vain for the white dress, and in the silence he vainly listened for the sound of footsteps. The house, which was discernible through the trees, remained in darkness and gave no indication that so important an event as the signature of a marriage contract was going on. Morel looked at his watch, which wanted a quarter to ten, but soon the same clock he had already heard strike two or three times rectified the error by striking half-past nine. This was already half an hour past the time Valentine had fixed. It was a terrible moment for the young man. The slightest rustling of the foliage, the least whistling of the wind, attracted his attention, and drew the perspiration to his brow. Then he tremblingly fixed his ladder, and not to lose a moment placed his foot on the first step. Amidst all these alternations of hope and fear the clock struck ten. It is impossible, said Maximilian, that the signing of a contract should occupy so long a time without unexpected interruptions. I have weighed all the chances, calculated the time required for all the forms. Something must have happened. And then he walked rapidly to and fro, and pressed his burning forehead against the fence. Had Valentine fainted, or had she been discovered and stopped in her flight? These were the only obstacles which appeared possible to the young man. The idea that her strength had failed her in attempting to escape, and that she had fainted in one of the paths, was the one that most impressed itself upon his mind. In that case, said he, I should lose her, and by my own fault. He dwelt on this idea for a moment, then it appeared reality. He even thought he could perceive something on the ground at a distance. He ventured to call, and it seemed to him that the wind wafted back an almost inarticulate sigh. At last the half-hour struck. It was impossible to wait longer. His temples throbbed violently. His eyes were growing dim. He passed one leg over the wall, and in a moment leaped down on the other side. He was on Villefort's premises, had arrived there by scaling the wall. What might be the consequences? However, he had not ventured thus far to draw back. He followed a short distance close under the wall, then crossed a path he had entered a clump of trees. In a moment he had passed through them, and he could see the house distinctly. 
Then Morel saw that he had been right in believing that the house was not illuminated. Instead of lights at every window, as is customary on days of ceremony, he saw only a gray mass which was veiled also by a cloud, which at that moment obscured the moon's feeble light. A light moved rapidly from time to time past three windows of the second floor. These three windows were in Madame de saint Marin's room. Another remained motionless behind some red curtains which were in Madame de Villefort's bedroom. Morel guessed all this. So many times, in order to follow Valentine in thought at every hour in the day, had he made her describe the whole house, that without having seen it, he knew it all. This darkness and silence alarmed Morel still more than Valentine's absence had done. Almost mad with grief, and determined to venture everything in order to see Valentine once more, and be certain of the misfortune he feared, Morel gained the edge of the clump of trees, and was going to pass as quickly as possible through the flower-garden when the sound of a voice still at some distance, but which was borne upon the wind, reached him. At this sound, as he was already partially exposed to view, he stepped back and concealed himself completely, remaining perfectly motionless. He had formed his resolution. If it was Valentine alone, he would speak as she passed. If she was accompanied, and he could not speak, still he should see her and know that she was safe. If they were strangers, he would listen to their conversation, and might understand something of this hitherto incomprehensible mystery. The moon had just then escaped from behind the cloud which had concealed it, and Morel saw Villefort come out upon the steps, followed by a gentleman in black. They descended in advance towards the clump of trees, and Morel soon recognized the other gentleman as Dr. de Avonray. The young man, seeing them approach, drew back mechanically until he found himself stopped by a sycamore tree in the centre of the clump. There he was compelled to remain. Soon the two gentlemen stopped also. "'Ah, my dear doctor,' said the procurer, "'heaven declares itself against my house. What a dreadful death! What a blow! Seek not to console me. Alas, nothing can alleviate so great a sorrow. The wound is too deep and too fresh. Dead! Dead!' The cold sweat sprang to the young man's brow, and his teeth chattered. Who could be dead in that house which Villefort himself had called accursed? "'My dear Monsieur de Villefort,' replied the doctor, with a tone which redoubled the terror of the young man, "'I have not led you here to console you. On the contrary.' "'What can you mean?' asked the procurer, alarmed. "'I mean that behind the misfortune which has just happened to you there is another perhaps still greater.' "'Can it be possible?' murmured Villefort, clasping his hands. "'What are you going to tell me? "'Are we quite alone, my friend?' "'Yes, quite. "'But why all these precautions?' "'Because I have a terrible secret to communicate to you,' said the doctor. "'Let us sit down.'" End of chapter 73, part 1